when you're the performer, your job is to make it seem like you're the magician and you just dropped in from heaven and you're going, Psh. Seats full of cameras and yeah, okay, lights and stuff. Um... We want to get as close to the loading bay of the theater as possible, please. Yeah, well, this is it. Where well, there's the least amount of carrying involved. <laughs> So if they're shy, you'll throw out some questions. I'll, I'll, um, if they're shy, I'll ask you some of the questions I've asked you in the past. Yeah. What, what is input? How far ahead do you think? Whatever, yeah. whatever comes to you, that's fine. Oh, this is the theatre. Played, mother played part of play. Little upright piano in the house. Little spinet, not even upright. So this is what people did in a family in Brooklyn, Flappish on Ocean Parkway in the 50s. This is what you did. And I used to wonder in my 20s, is this ever going to sound good? Am I ever going to love what I'm doing, or am I just going to hate myself my whole life? Something that might be interesting is if you guys could sing the note, that note, you could, that's beautiful. And I'll do a little cadenza over that. So if you get tired, just make sure your partner is keep the note going. <laughs> Thank you. 
Small but mighty group, and I actually <laughs> prefer that. <laughs> Questions? Yes? I have a question about improvisation. Can I have a yeah? Yes, um, then. When you say you improvise, but how far are you planning ahead when you improvise? Isn't, isn't that cheating if you're planning ahead? Isn't improvisation supposed to be an instant thing? Is it an instant thing with you? How far ahead do you plan if it's over? One, one ten thousandth of a second, maybe? <laughs> if, <laughs> if that. If. I don't believe it. <laughs> really? Yeah, absolutely. Because if you think it in the head, you're not in the moment. So you, you're just sort of creating the spot. So if I'm sitting there playing this F blues, which is the middle section of the uh, blue rondo. Done in the moment. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's very good, sometimes it's not so good. It comes out. It comes out. Just like your question. Mm -hmm. You know, you got. <laughs> <laughs> I'll turn another. Keep, keep, keep thinking I'll, of them. Keep thinking of them, Harry. The initial interest that David Bowie had in Mike Garson was that Mike was an avant garde jazz pianist, and David Bowie was a superb kind of magpie, picking up different artistic inputs wherever he could find them and absorbing them into his own work and creating something new from that. And that was always Bowie's genius in a way. And so Mike was no exception. You're putting yourself on the line when you say you're an improvising musician. That's, that's dangerous territory. I'm giving a class at the Colburn Conservatory called Improvisation for the Classical Musician. I play for the kids, they play for me. They complain, how come this doesn't sound good? How come I'm not focused here? I said, you are not gonna bat 100% when you're doing improvised music. But when you go into that zone and you're really doing it well, even if it's 20% of the time or 30% like of the time, when you're in that zone, it's actually a higher form of art in creating than composing. You tell me. C sharp major. C. C. 
See? Okay. Got a major or minor? C major. Okay. And in four or three or out of timing or uh, fast or slow or melodic or just, should I just listen to you? Or the sound effects. Okay. I'll, I'll lead the way. Okay. That's a C, I hope. In 1972, Mike Garson was in New York, uh, his hometown, teaching the piano. Uh, his wife, Susan, who he's still happily married to today, had gone out to work and uh, left him with their young baby, Jennifer, who was about one year old, swinging in a hammock, and he was uh, teaching a piano lesson. And uh, the night before, he had come home from a jazz gig and had said to Susan, I can't go on like this. He had come home with something like $5. Uh, the pay was virtually non-existent, as it often still is for jazz musicians. And uh, playing to a small club, a handful of people, and loving what he did, being absolutely passionate about the music, but coming home that night before and, and saying, um, I can't go on like this. We, we need, I need to do something else, obviously with music, but there has to be something more lucrative that I can get into following day he's giving this lesson and the phone rings and uh, somebody by the name of Tony DeFries asks him whether he would be free for an immediate audition because uh, he had been recommended to be the pianist for David Bowie uh, who was just arriving in America already an up-and-coming star in England but trying to break America and Mike's reply was David who? <laughs> Haven't of him at all. And uh, nevertheless, he picked up on the idea that this was an up-and-coming rock star. And what perfect uh, synchronicity of timing that this was just literally hours after he had told his wife, I can't go on with the work that I'm doing. So he felt he had to seize the opportunity, carpe diem. And um, he asked his piano student to look after the baby. What other choice did he have? dived in the car, he had to drive across Manhattan for 20 minutes to the RCA studios where the audition was to take place. And uh, he tells the story of how his wife nearly killed him when she got home to find this random piano student looking after their newborn baby. When he gets there, he's greeted by this extraordinary sight of David Bowie in the guise of Ziggy Stardust in full costume, mind you, in the afternoon doing this audition uh, with his spiders from Mars. And for some reason or other, they were all in character. And so Mike didn't quite know what had hit him. He didn't know what to make of it. And um, they were clustered in the, uh, in the booth, as they would have in those days, of course, the, the, the isolation booth. And, and uh, he got onto the piano and Mick Ronson, who at the time was sort of acting as David Bowie's musical director, handed Mike a scrap of paper with a few chords scribbled on it and said, this is a song we've been doing. Uh, could you just play from these chords? The song was called Changes. And although today we all know and love this song, um, Mike, again, hadn't heard of this. It had been out for a few months in England, but he didn't know about the song, so he had to quickly read the scribbled chords and develop a theme from that, just the introduction. And um, he played it very jazzily, 
as was his style. And uh, they loved it. And within seconds, Mick Rodson said, you're in. And uh, this was to be an absolute turning point for Mike Garson. Really, uh, in that romantic way, changed his life overnight. And it really did, because the tour was beginning just a week or two later uh, in Cleveland. And um, he really didn't look back. He had to throw himself into this. He was given a cassette tape with 20 songs on it to learn virtually overnight. And uh, here was this man who was a classical pianist and a jazz pianist about to also become a rock and pop pianist. And one of the things that I connected to right away about Mike's music is that it's kind of all over the place. Um, and yeah, you, you go from something that sounds very 19th century romantic to something that's totally jazzy to something that sounds like it's, uh, you know, comes out of the 20th century or contemporary classical music tradition. Um, and, and then there's a lot of stuff that's really kind of, uh, kind of new agey. So he's, he's in many places all at once. And that's because Mike is a musical sponge who soaks up all sorts of influences. And actually, that goes beyond just his music, too. I mean, I'd say he, he is a, a very deep person and a thinker who soaks up lots of ideas just in general. And then that, that filters into his music. In a sense, it's, it's almost a manic music personality <laughs> because it, it can go from one extreme to another. Well, Mike is one of those artists who has a very eclectic and diverse musical background. And unfortunately, I think this is one of the reasons why he hasn't been embraced wholeheartedly by the mainstream classical world. His association with David Bowie and other rock pop musicians, uh, while he's done actually really interesting and outside the box work in that, in that arena, just being associated with that music is a problem for a lot of people in the mainstream jazz or classical world. And they say, oh, well, this person's just a rock musician, so we're not gonna pay attention to that. And likewise, even just between the classical world and the jazz world, there can be some tension. So because a lot of what Mike does is uh, improvisational, there are a lot of people in the classical world who poo-poo that just because that's not what happens in that world. <laughs> As an improviser, he certainly can hold his own against you know people like Keith Jarrett and Chick Corea. From a young age, Mike had classical piano lessons, from what I understand, and you know had that traditional upbringing. Uh, so he he was familiar with that world already. And then growing up in New York and being able to learn jazz kind of the old-fashioned way by by just going and hearing some of the best jazz musicians live, and eventually you know studying with them and playing with them. He 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 went into the jazz world. And then, when he was relatively young, younger than I am, is when he, you know, kind of haphazardly stumbled into the David Bowie thing, which really determined the trajectory of the rest of his career. One of the biggest problems every student has is they want to play pieces harder than they can really handle and that their fingers and muscles are developed for. So I would take a very, I'd rather see someone take a very simple but beautiful piece and play it beautifully, and then get a little more difficult. Do you remember I was teaching you about that dotted quarter to the eighth? And that I, I, I was talking more to the piano players at the time, but I mentioned in jazz that it came from a beat in the 1920s called the Charleston beat, where in bum, 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 bum. It's a syncopation that's used a million times in jazz. How affected are you by the audience? Tell me a little bit about well, the audience. Well, your point, first of all, is very, very valid and it's no use to have dread or fear because it doesn't produce a good result. Sometimes you can't control it, and there have been times I've been on the stage, I couldn't even reach the keys, my hands would freeze, and I couldn't play the first few bars, and the band took off. I'd been that nervous. So it's not like 
everything I'm telling you, I'm perfect at and great at it. I, 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 I've been very blessed to be playing music for like 60 years, you know what I mean? I'm 67, I've been playing for 60 years. So I've, I've been in every kind of a situation, playing wrong chords, the wrong key for somebody, nervousness, nerves, anxiety. So I've experienced all those things, but they're worthless. So, so there have been times I've been affected totally by the audience, other times 90%, sometimes 50%. In our conversation over the last few weeks, it's zero. That's why I'm loving it. Because this is an improv, it's no different than when I'm playing the piano. So it's that kind of fluency. You can, act, this is what amazes me. You can go from your brain to your fingers and produce the sound. You know what that's gonna sound like. Exactly. Hello. <laughs> resort 110 miles north of New York City, which was called the Catskills. So that's where I got a lot of my training. Every summer, I'd go up there and play in different bands for eight years. And I learned how to accompany singers, dancers, comedians. I played for strippers. I did the whole thing. As I was 12, I played for a New York critic, the Revolutionary Etude by Chopin, and his name was Abram Chasens. He was very well known in the New York scene. And I w it was the first and only audition I ever did in classical, and the last, the first and the last, because I saw how ugly that world was, and he was vicious at me, and screaming at me. I overpedaled, and my touch was terrible, and everything he said was right. It's just that I, I, that's not what I was ready to hear and prepared to hear, and I was shocked because I knew I was talented, and I didn't know how to correct what he was telling me and what he should have said is virtually what I said to you last week. You know, son, you're very, very talented. All you need to do is slow down, get rid of the pedal for a few months, practice slowly, uh, take a piece a little simpler and, and everything will be fine. Here last month in San Diego, I was shocked in a club, but we mic'd it and I did the job. You know, once you're there, you have to make the music. If you get prima donna-like and start complaining, it's just gonna pull down the vibe of the whole band and the music. So I've learned through the years to sort of be bigger than the technical problems that you're gonna have. I had a piano in the, that I played on a gig that was a dance gig with my band in 1966. It was an upright piano, and there were 30 or 40 hammers. The notes were actually ripped out, 
and there were salt shakers put in there and small ketchup bottles. And I had to play for four hours dance music. I actually had half the amount of notes. The actual hammers that come up were not even there. I used the 30 or 40 notes that were left. I was jumping all over the place. <laughs> Ten dollars an hour it was a higher than minimum wage at the time. Could be worse. Could be worse. Oh, yeah. Could be in Gaza Strip right now, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. This is no. Yeah. The disc clavier is the big one there. Well, this. That's that. That's that's that. that. That will play back like the old player pianos. This one will um, record the information and I could play my synthesizers from here. I could shut the piano off. So to be able to play a keyboard sound from my real piano is kind of a joy for me. Anyone who's played an instrument, even if they're not making a living from it, which is 90% of the population, if they don't play, my theory is they're a little grouchy. If they do play, they're happy. They don't have to all be in Carnegie Hall. But I've heard a lot of music that can be very irritating, you know, certain kinds of gangster rap and certain kinds of alternative stuff where it's just so in your face because the people are so who are creating are so frustrated with life, they're using so much force, so much fire, that it's actually dangerous for the listeners. But for the most part, music <laughs> is a beautiful thing. Most piano students, they end off when they're depressed and frustrated. The secret is to end off when you're feeling sort of good. You made a little breakthrough that day. The run sounded like that, and now it sounds like that. Cleaner. First it sounds like that, then it sounds like that, you know? So that's an accomplishment. Give yourself a little win, take a break, be done with it. After he passed, then sort of, I'm one of the guys holding the torch and had been with him the longest, so consequently, people are interested to be connected to that person. I had really no idea of how what a huge influence and how incredibly famous he was. But you're not well, so off the wall. When I got the call in 73, I never even heard of him. Yeah. And he was already world famous. And since he passed, I've learned even more about his brilliance, kind of like a Renaissance guy. Yeah. He was in that rock world. So when I added all this fancy piano stuff, it acted as some good whipped cream on the cake and gave him some more validity. Do you think that you... you gained yourself personally from, from him, from the whole experience there? I think I really did. I think I undermined it for many years because I was kind of a jazz and classical snob and I tended to think of it as lesser music. And I had to let it go and recognize there's a lot of great art that comes from pop culture as well as classical opera culture and jazz culture. And I recognized he had some amazing gifts. I'll warm up a few minutes before a gig, but the bottom line is the legato practicing, the relaxing like I told you, where you go like that and you actually let the, all the pressure from going down, there's pressure here. See, that's not so good, but if you go down, you get a beautiful tone that way. So that's where the clarity comes. You just speed that up and it starts to sound like that. New at 5, a music legend takes his talents from the stage to the studio. This time, though, he's composing songs for people suffering from Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. As Orange County reporter Greg Lee shows us, sometimes music therapy can help improve some medical conditions. Nancy Default needs a walker to get around. She says her body's stiff and she often suffers from tremors. It's gotten worse over the last 20 years since doctors first diagnosed her with Parkinson's disease. It causes nerve cells in the brain to die, affecting a person's movement. Balance is always an issue, and 
I tend to have a lot of falls. It's been especially tough on Nancy because she and her husband Bob own a dance studio. She's tried different medications, even had brain surgery, but the defaults say there's only one therapy that always works. When we dance and we're in a dance frame, she feels totally secure and you wouldn't believe what she can do. Especially when they dance to this tango, written for them by Mike Garson. The legendary pianist and composer has played with David Bowie, Nine Inch Nails, and the Smashing Pumpkins. Now he wants to use his music to help people with brain diseases. The music as a therapy can eliminate a lot of drugs and a lot of things of that nature. Garson and neurosurgeon Dr. Christopher Duma founded the Music Heals Project. The idea, write music for patients with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, autism, even depression, and see what effect it has on their condition. Perhaps music with its beats, with its meters, with its, with its pulses, will resynchronize some of those brain waves. As the research for the project continues, Dr. Duma says the next step is for patients to wear headphones for several hours a day and see how it improves their daily lives. For the defaults, they say it's not only made Nancy feel better, it's gotten them both back to doing what they love. For that amount of time, the tremor disappears and the rigidity definitely goes Away. Greg Lee, ABC7 Eyewitness News. Well, I'm so happy that there's no traffic right now that I'll answer any question any way you like. Right. It was the traffic that makes me crazy. We'll be down in Orange County in about 20 minutes. All these people who are driving on the freeway, hopefully they'll come to the concert. We're selling tickets as we're driving. We need to fill 1,500 seats. So right now we have two tickets sold, friends of Harry's. <laughs> so it could be a very empty auditorium. Are you, are you implying that I have no friends? I'm implying I have no audience. <laughs> Everyone's afraid of my avant-garde music. They don't know this piece will actually be tonal and won't be only virtuosity, so they won't be fed up with me. Where are you, you going to pick up all these musicians? I literally am picking, hand-picking each musician. Now, do you think they'll object to having your hands all over them if you're going to hand-pick them? This is troubling, isn't it? Hand-picking does not mean touching them, Harry. I've had that with Billy and, and with Bowie, and the, the agreement or the tacit agreement became, as long as I make the introductions somewhat familiar so they know how to come in with their voice, because they don't want to be put in an uncompromising situation, so they've begged me to sort of play similar introductions and similar endings. In the middle, they sort of let me do what I want. In the Bowie band, I was probably improvising on all the tours and records I did 85% of the time. Do you have any, maybe any wild and crazy tour hijinks with you and Bowie? You guys are <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Spill the beans, Mike. No, you know, I never um, experienced what most rock musicians uh, have gone through, to be honest with you. I was married during the whole time I was with Bowie, and I saw too many of my friends die from drugs, so that eliminated that. So I kind of stuck to the music. I was, they kind of saw me as square when I was, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20, but I kind of saw the traps connected with vanity and ego and, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, so, but I love the music. What do you do for eight hours practice? 
Well, um, yeah, the first two hours with scales. So I play them very slowly. Very slowly, play them in rhythm, play them short like staccatos and what's called legato, very smooth. And I do the same thing with arpeggios. You know, in all types of scales. Anything to move the fingers and exercise. Then I would do sight reading, I'd read Bach, you know. So I'd repeat over and over and play slowly and then build it up. And then I would go into ear training. I would take records of my favorite heroes. At the time, they were vinyl. So I would listen to them and notate what, what my heroes were playing. So I would learn the styles of jazz. And I did it with uh, some pop and rock stuff, too. I remember listening to Dr. John and Leon Russell and some of these piano players, New Orleans guys and people playing, you know. <laughs> I would get into that. Blues kind of playing was fun. And uh, then I would compose for a few hours and sit there with pen and pencil and uh, music paper and find, try to find melodies and uh, do a lot of listening to, to recordings, just sit back and listen and absorb the music. And then I was learning a lot of classical pieces, so that took hours, like if I was playing Chopin. <laughs> You know, those kind of things, very noty, and they, they take a certain amount of time, you know. But I don't do any of that anymore. I just do whatever it seems like I need to do. If I feel like a song is coming, I give space to allow that song to come through. If I want to, if I have a performance coming up, I might think about some of the things I want to play, practice them, get familiar with them. Uh, so it's much more free-for-all now. So if you think about infinite discipline, that I did all those years, or not infinite, but tons of discipline leading to tons of freedom. Now I'm able to experience the freedom part. Can I get a picture of the shoes? The shoes? Can you do that? And the people in the fans in the back. 
Andrew, what? I, I know these people. He has a direct connection through the heart to his hands where there is no limitation technically or harmonically or rhythmically of what might be running through his head. So the minute something flashes in, his hands will do it. And it's remarkable how, you know, creative and sometimes amazingly accurate it can be as though his fingers are just rumbling because stream of consciousness feeding in all of a sudden it's Stravinsky, then it's Ligeti, then it's Brahms, then it's Rachmaninoff. So that he has, for me, by far the biggest vocabulary of what he can do with the brain, heart, and the hands. And for most people, it's too much. It's, it's as though the musical dictionary, the vocabulary is always handy for him. Whereas for most of us, we have about 5% of that. And it seems like a lot for the rest of us. For me, I would say 70 to 80% of it, I really respect. I probably really like 40% of it. I'm blown away by 100% of it. One of the things that has always impressed me about him, and especially I'd say the last 15 years, is that he will really do a pretty detailed survey and study of a particular composer, reading a lot of the music, just absorbing what does composer X do. And then two days later, he hits the record button and basically channels a lot of what he got from that composer. And those are the ones that blow me away. Those are the ones that it's like, okay, there's something going on here that you can't codify. I've been around, I've been at classical music festivals where Free Flight has been a guest artist and the pianists are completely blown away by what he does with whatever piece, either something standard like Gershwin or his own compositions or a jazz standard. I mean, but look, the guy is talented. He's definitely genius level. However, he may have worked harder than any other pianist I know. I mean, drilled and drilled and drilled. His left hand, the power and the facility of his left hand is unlike most that I've ever seen. But it's because he spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours drilling left hand uh, exercises. I spent three months just sitting this low on the piano because I heard you get a better sound if you're sitting low like Glenn Gould. You need to play within a pulse if you're playing. Or there's that pulse that's going. So you could even make up music. Doesn't matter, because once the time is good, people, that's why people like dance music and they go to clubs. They like the pulse of that bass drum.
let's do something else. Should we do the intro? Or? Come on, let's go. Let's Anything. See. Anything. I love to play and I love to perform, but I don't particularly love to practice. This is a piece by Mike Garson that I've been practicing on and off for, oh, good God, almost 10 years, which is a terrifying thought. <laughs> I just realized that. Unfortunately, it's also one of the most difficult pieces I've ever tried to play. I mean, I, I'm sitting here practicing this stuff and it's like, I don't know how much, <laughs> how much closer I can get. He wants it, you know. Just ridiculous. <laughs> well, I heard you playing it at breakneck speed on the top of it. I can play it pretty fast. I can't play it as fast as he really wants it. And one of my jobs has been to try to convince him that for a lot of his really fast pieces, that the very fast tempo that he's gotten used to hearing is maybe not really the ideal tempo of the piece. I, I thought it sounded pretty good there when you, you, you did that. Yeah, I can't play the whole piece at that tempo, no, though. But, um, <laughs> God knows, this playing is amazing. When you're improvising, you're not necessarily playing with the same level of nuance and control that you would if you were playing something you've been practicing for hours and hours and days and, and months. When I'm approaching Mike Garson's music, one of the things that I always have to keep in mind is that these were improvisations, and sometimes there are even notes that seem kind of like mistakes. And so I sometimes have to make some decisions about whether maybe, maybe if he had it to do over again, he would play this note instead of that note. Yeah, this piece has been a worthy adversary. <clears throat> All right, here we go. I'm gonna attempt to get so this, this under is tempo. Danny Hold playing the homage to Chopin and Godowski that I improvised, what would it be, 10 years ago, would you think? I think, yeah, 2001, even more, yeah. 12 years ago, I was 25 at the time. <laughs> All right, here we go.
play it that fast right now, but. but. Like most people, the first time I heard him was Aladdin Sane. And he said that, you know, he got paid scale and he had no idea that that was going to be, you know, one of the crowning uh, ch achievements, I sure, no things that he's uh, known for, the source of his notoriety. But when you're a young person and you hear Aladdin Sane for the first time, it's shocking. And I came from the Billy Joel Elton John piano school of, you know, a songwriting and uh, pop rock kind of stuff. And I didn't grow up with classical, I didn't grow up with jazz. Bowie, somebody that was in my realm, when I heard Aladdin Sane and that piano solo comes in, I didn't have the reference points at the time to know anything that was being done. All I could think was wow, of saying wow, there's something I can't even understand here. While still uh, not having come from classical, I can't tell as you can. Oh, that was the Schumann piece, you know, the minute you walked in when I had the record on. It's, it's like he was channeling bits of everything that he had ever done. One of the things about classical music is it is a competition in, of sorts in competency. It's a competition of execution. So that's why we have classical competitions. Who can execute the piece the best? With improvisation, which, and he said in that solo, when he first came in, he tried a couple takes, and Bowie said, look, you're the, you're the crazy jazz guy. Do the crazy jazz thing. And he, that's what came out. Had he put more insight into it, had he written that, had he polished it, don't think it would have been as good. It had to come from that spontaneous moment. Too fast. You're talking about double A, right, Montuno? Yeah. Latin Dam 380. I'll set the tempo. I mean, do you think it should be the same tempo? No. Where we it's a slow, slower tempo, no? I thought so. Now, is that about the speed? Well, we rehearsed it this way. Making my life easier, but I, I think you're making too many holes. If you, every time you have a new thing, you put another hole and another hole and another hole and another hole, you lose any continuity in the piece. As much as you can go through, you're better off. Um, not comfortable with that. So. Trust me, let me start alone, and then the rhythm section comes in, because those two okay, bars... Okay, so, so have you written this for the rhythm section coming in one after the other or not? Because yes. in my score, it's not like... What happens, this is one of the things I wanted to change, you know, because... Well, we haven't got the rehearsal time to fool around with changing. 
Whatever we do, we have to write beforehand. Correct. Well, let me tell you, see those two bars? Yeah, I know. That's so a band that'll go for about 90 seconds. It starts with me. My rhythm section comes in now. Bass syndrome. And that yeah. just keeps but, but going. What I, I may suggest, if I may, because I'd like this just not, not to get static. So what I have worked out was that the congas start after the first repeat. Then the clays join on the well, second repeat. The cowbells join on the third or the fourth repeat, whatever it is. And then you can go on for that for as long as you like. Okay, when you, I was bringing my drum in on the fifth bar. Is that all right? You bring it in when you like. Okay. You can build the other you like. And, and, and basically, I was going to play a piano solo. Then I was going to switch to a different feeling, which is going to sound like this. And the drums plays a solo over that vamp, which goes on for about 40 seconds. Then she comes in. You rehearse whatever you rehearse. So basically, this big glissando and the brass is tacit. We're not doing it at all. Where did it come? I forgot. Was it 383? I don't mind it. You don't mind what? That coming in? Well, I can't come in because I have no idea where you're going to start.
perfect. Well, our research has clearly demonstrated that when people are engaged in creative musical expression, there are DNA changes that occur throughout the body. I know that there's a deep connection. And it's not just in blood pressure. It's not just in pulse rate. It's really about what's happening biologically. I'm not reinventing the wheel here. I think what's happening is science is now starting to catch up. Of course, music makes you feel good. Music has always done that. The difference is, when I see some of my patients with, for example, Parkinson's disease, who are stiff and rigid, who, upon hearing a waltz and getting on the dance floor, all of a sudden they're able to move flawlessly. There's something going on in the limbic system in the brain, something that is triggering a release mechanism that these patients are, are not, not naturally doing on their own. I'm in search for that that trigger. I'm in search for the, 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 the space in the brain that allows us to do what we're being inhibited from doing. Did I play that note you were talking about? Was that the one? Oh. Do you want me to do it exactly like that? Is it notated somewhere like that? I might not have notated it. Uh, it's always different in the parts. I change it all the time. <laughs> Um, so then you're out? We're out for... What are you in? Bar three, one? C. C. Three, four. Oh. times when you're in a digging a ditch, music is not going to help, and you're staying under so the bomb doesn't go off. That's There are people living under those conditions or making a dollar a day. I'm not 
particularly advocating let's get them over to a concert. Let's keep them, get them some shelter and get them some food. You, you, you do what's logical. But people like us who are unfortunate in a, in a society where there's abundance, let's try to raise the aesthetic level. <laughs>
All right, we're done. We're out of here. Get a refund. There's nothing else to play. I like this one. It's a fanfare, you know, brass, and you'll hear all kinds of snares and crazy stuff going on. It's kind of fun. Come in. Hi, sweetheart. I'm going to sleep soon, so is it okay if you to um, uh, take the picture of me right now? How about in three minutes? Okay, three Stay minutes. Stay right here. Sit down and have a listen. Okay. Can I sit on your lap? Sure. And, um, what kind of note is there when you play the paddle? They usually write P-E-D on the bottom. Let's try it from the top with the with <laughs> Teresa play. No, she's gonna play this time. Uh -huh. I haven't taught you this one yet. Ah. Uh -huh. Okay. It's coming up in piano. It's coming. Up. Listen to what she does on hall. Gratitude, you're not on. It's the next to last. I wrote that for him because he has autism, but he's coming a long way. He has autism. He did not recognize people for years. We took pictures of him, and he was so far gone that no one was in the picture. Now he's bright, and he loves talking to people. He was like five years ago, so anxious and ner nervous. And I put him on my lap like today, and I played the piano. I literally felt him melt into my lap. Mike Garson is the musician who has played, or he did play, more times with David Bowie than any other musician ever. And this is a, a little known fact, but I think it's important to, to, to bear that in mind. Certainly if you add together stage appearances on world tours, together with recordings on albums and um, other work, television and so on, uh, there's no musician who ever played as many times as Mike did with Bowie. And that raises the question of why that would be, because David Bowie really used hundreds of different musicians, and he was an absolute expert at choosing the right musicians for the right project or album. It was his genius. Why did he use Mike so much over the years? I think it's because, well, there are three or four reasons. Firstly, Mike has an extremely high competency. His technical ability is, is, is virtually flawless, and that's very important um, when putting a band together. He's also extremely adaptable and versatile. He has that vast musical vocabulary, which was put together through very hard work from the early years onwards, where in his teens he would go and study every composer that he could get his hands on in close detail to absorb all of those inputs into his style and then use those. So Mike can play in virtually any style uh, to order. And this was, this was useful to Bowie. One, two, three. One, two, three. Louder. Louder. Thank you. Louder. Speak, speak, speak. <coughs> Please speak, speak, speak. Do you have your answers to your questions already? I have the answers. <laughs> you can provide the questions. <laughs> you were a pre-med, was it, or something? I was a pre-med student. Thank you for the answer to that question. Moving on. You were pre-med, yes. <laughs> you were... All right. It's going to be one of those. Is... All right. I will put the answer in the question. <laughs> were you pre-med? Well, you know, when the D-minus came in from the final test, I walked the teacher over to the window. He was a biology genius who had written 
some of the first PhDs on DNA. And, uh, and this is a first biology class when he should have been talking to us about cells and paramecium and things of that nature, we're studying these DNA and RNA. So he was out of his mind in terms, of, it would be like me teaching a new piano student, a rock monument of third piano concerto, the second week. It was way over my head. It was a blessing in disguise. Uh, and I moved off into, I showed him, I looked out the window and I pointed to this music building that was about 100 yards away. I said, I think I landed in the wrong building. I said, I'll make you a deal. If you don't give me an F and fail me, if you give me a D, I'll never see you again and I'll switch over to music. He said, that would be my pleasure. <laughs> and that was the end of it. I wanted to heal with medicine. I failed terribly and I'm now in the middle of my anxiety suite rather than healing suite. So um, this, is, this is what one has to deal with when you try to do something lofty. I don't recommend, especially to most musicians who like the dark side of life. A lot of musicians can only write when they're um, uh, depressed and dark and uh, drugged out of their mind, things of that nature. I, I can write if I'm very, very happy. I could also write if I'm sad or depressed. So uh, I don't feel I need uh, darkness as my only palette. Music like gangster rap and like disgusting words where you're really being abusive to women and things of this actually does the opposite. So not all music heals at all. Well, music is a double-edged sword. Uh, it can absolutely be used to harm and certainly a lot of the heavy punk music and a lot of the gangster rap music, there's a lot of intentions in there uh, are very destructive uh, and, and, and the words and what they're saying uh, I feel is not very healthy. So I like the beats of that music and unfortunately that's what captivates the audience because the beats are so, so good in that music. So people love good rhythm, you know. How come today was a little more magical? I always describe musicians when they're performing, they were either professional that night or they were in the zone and had the magic. There's a big difference to me, you know. Yeah. And I've also always differentiated between an artist and a musician. And a, a good musician could sit in an orchestra, play the parts perfect and all that, but they all won't be Asha Heifetz or Rubenstein or Vladimir Hartz or, 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 or Glenn Gould. So there's a magic that comes with it. But no musician or artist will hit it 100% of the time. We're all batting 30, 40, 50 percent, and we're grateful for that. There was a period in the 80s, I swear to you, I wasn't batting over 3 percent. Every concert I played, I wanted to throw up because I was continuously criticizing myself and, and, and coaching myself, and as I'm playing, fix this, fix that. You can't create music that way. You can do that afterwards. When you're up there, you have to be a man and take responsibility. This is the best I have right now, and let it out. So when I'm teaching a piano student, my goal is not necessarily just make him a better piano student. Well, that goes without say, but it's, it's to get him to do whatever that person wants. So if he comes to me after two years and say, you know, my heart's not really in this, but I want to be a physician or I want to be a banker or a lawyer, and I helped create that because I showed him how much he had to practice and he didn't want to do it, it opens the door. Not too bad. There are some great spots and there's some shaky spots, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. You hear them, right? Yeah. Yeah. How are we ever going to fix those spots in the middle where it gets sloppy? When I toured uh, with Bowie, our opening act in the 90s was Nine Inch Nails. This guy was screaming, he was cursing, there were guitars flying in the air. And he did this like for 20 years and then one day he was sort of better. <laughs> and so was his audience. It's, it's almost like they healed themselves from screaming to death for 20 years and cursing and songs called Star and I want to feel like an animal. These were the names of the songs. And I'd be out there in the audience, open up this healing suite with, I want to fuck you like an animal. But you know, he was just expressing like every guy's thought in the audience who was 18 and 16 and 20. So while it's offensive to us, in a way, there was more honesty there. You know? Good, Dom. All right. Hold on, Mike.
Thank you. Jessica Tibbins, when you heard those high notes, you haven't heard anything yet. Rest my case. Well, God, it's a fine case, too. It's <laughs> really, really pretty.